in the last stronghold of the weird ones. Today on Dumpster Book Club, we're talking about The Knot World by Thomas Burnett Swan. I'm Sean. And I'm Mimi. And this book is kind of like a big bag of Fritos. (laughs) What? Okay, it's like the first Frito is delicious, but then like halfway through you're kind of done. And then by the end of the Fritos, you like really don't ever want to eat Fritos anymore. You feel like you ate a whole bag of Fritos. Yeah. I should warn you that I loved this book. And if you say anything bad about it, I'm going to end this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) No, um, I actually liked it. Also, I mean, it's got the Frito problem. It starts out really, really good, and then you get pretty sick of it. Well, I listened to the audiobook copy, um, so I had to listen to the whole thing twice, all the way through. And it was a pretty fun book, but I think the more I stopped to think about what was going <laughs> on, the more I realized this book is kind of stupid. Yeah. Luckily, it's really short, so it doesn't linger with you too much. You don't have to stick stick with the characters too long. I wouldn't read this a second time. I would definitely read more of this author, though. Do you want to talk about the cover? The cover's not great. I think the best part is it has that classic DAW yellow spine with the red author and black title. Um. I'm always, Pretty much any time I see that, I get a little bit excited for some bargain bin <laughs> sci-fi. But what about this horrible creature? Yeah, it's horse book number two for us. <laughs> but this time it's it's a mer horse. It has like a tail like a mermaid, but then it has front legs, but they turned into webbed toes instead of hooves. Long, stringy flipper paws. Yeah, it's pretty... The feet are the most disturbing part. Otherwise... A mer horse isn't... I know you would be terrified of that, but... <laughs> yeah. And then there's a, you know, a, a lady clinging to its neck. I didn't expect this to happen in the book, but it, especially in the beginning, I was like, oh, there's no way this is going to happen in the book. And it totally does happen in the book. Yeah, pretty accurate. Um, a woman rides a mer horse in this book. Yeah. <laughs> um. Also, since you listened to the audiobook, you missed out on all the pictures. I'll wait till the parts come up, and then I'll show you the pictures. But there is the one in the beginning. Oh, (laughs) my God. Look at those horrible little goblins. Yeah, it's that classic 70s uh, fantasy book drawings that you would see inside them. And this one has uh, two pretty grotesque goblins pointing at a balloon. (laughs) The audiobook had a lot of production value, though. The reader was... I think the reader was Jem Matson, and he really threw himself into his work in narrating the whole book. He sang all the songs. Oh, that's great. Did all the voices. How was he on all the poetry? Like the songs, or...? Was it... Is it all songs? Yeah, anytime there's a poem, he sings it. Oh, man, I read a lot of them as just poetry. Um, But I do think that the way he read some of the characters' voices definitely influenced how I interpreted them. So I think we'll talk about more. We'll talk <laughs> yeah, about that I more. I wonder what Adeline it. sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> um okay well, do you want to before we get into it do you have stuff to say about thomas burnett swan well i did look up thomas burnett swan and it turns out he's also a poet yeah i, I totally who, who would have guessed yeah. from this book i'm assuming not a particularly famous or great poet either the poetry's not bad it's not offensive but it's definitely not good poetry and he wrote a lot of other books that are I think mainly Greek and Roman mythology based. seems like this might have been one that was more Celtic mythology, but... 
There even even though it is Celtic, some Greek and Roman stuff seeps yep. in. Obvious that he's got a passion there. Much better Celtic influence than Hobgoblin. <laughs> yep. Apparently, in a lot of his books, there's an undercurrent of sexuality. Um, so it's not just this one. Many of Swan's characters are sexually adventurous and regard sexual repression as spiritually damaging. Yeah, I think I liked some of that in here with the Puritans and uh, Dylan's sexual awakening and stuff, but it was also maybe not handled very well, (laughs) but uh, that was a part I liked. This book, I think, came out in 1975, and Thomas Burnett Swan actually died the following year. Oh. from cancer so one of his final books late swan <laughs> that that's all the things on there yeah okay well this book starts off really good are you talking about the opening prologue or yeah the prologue's really strong i'm gonna try to read this it's kind of long but i think it was i just really liked it and I thought it was like a perfect introdu- introduction to the book and kind of just how the first half of the book is. All right, go for it. <clears throat> it was a forest of bristle with oak and yew, entangled with ivy and wild grapevines. The, the listening trees, trees they, they were, were called, called the strangling vines. It was a Celtic forest in the Age of Enlightenment, and the citizens of Bristol, whether the shepherd to find a sheep or the forester to fell an oak, refused to risk its threadless labyrinth because it did not belong to God. It belonged to the gods. At night, the farmers and foresters could hear the wailing of the drusii, or bloodsuckers, and see their eyes glinting like evil stars in a sky of black foliage. Here, too, the cannibalistic water horses, which swam in the streams and whinnied their dark hungers or wallowed in mud and slime. Were they truly trees and vines, birds and animals, or the old Celtic gods who had metamorphosed themselves with the coming of Christ and kept, deadly and inviolate, this one last stronghold against the angelic hosts? Bristol was change and challenge, the sun at high noon. Bristol was now. The forest was of the night of dreams and especially nightmares. The forest was then. Was then. Was then. I think I read that last line as a statement instead of a question. And I don't know if it's going to be too long. But man, that, it just like pumped me up. I was ready <laughs> to read this story when I read that. And that's like page two. Those water horses, the description of how they kill people is that they use their flippers to drown you. <laughs> And it's pretty comical, but also absolutely terrifying. The scariest thing you could imagine, yeah. Mimi. <laughs> um, did did we ever? I don't know if I missed it or something. Did they ever say what a drusii was? Um, I did a quick Google, and that's not a common thing, or at least it didn't come up in Google. Well, they suck your blood. They have leathery wings. Okay, yeah. But they can take the form of a person. Oh, okay. That makes sense now because later in the book, they're kind of like humanoid things. In the beginning, they're kind of like owls. And I just got confused. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, this book, the whole thing is a pastiche of very classic fantasy like Lord Dunsany or Midsummer's Night. Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer's Night Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream. It's obviously not as good as those. It's still a very modernized lexicon, but... <coughs> Is lexicon the wrong word? Uh, I think Pretty so. sure lexicon's the right word. It's like vocabulary. Yeah. Like a group of words... Or do you mean like the story? No, no, no. I meant the the group of words. Oh, okay. Sorry, then. Did I have the right word? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I always thought lexicon meant. Yeah. Anyway, 
but it, it just it does a great job of giving you that feel of reading some real old classic fantasy tale that that like early 1900s kind of pre lovecraft fantasy pre lovecraft pre um pre tolkien yeah and is very whimsical i really got into <laughs> it the story starts with Deirdre, who's riding in a carriage from Bath to Bristol, or from Bristol to Bath. Or Bristol to London? I don't remember. But <laughs> they're passing the not world, which is that forest that's described in the beginning where people don't venture, and the horses go crazy and di- dive into the forest. And Deirdre is our main character. She is a wealthy invalid. She has a leg injury that prevents her from walking without a cane, and walking at all causes her a great amount of pain. She has a fan with a secret vial of laudanum. Yeah, she. I think she has a laudanum addiction. She's an author. And all of her stories are semi-feminist uh, adventure tales about heroines that adventure in forests and deserts and stuff. And she's fairly popular. Later we get the backstory of her leg injury. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it starts with her being able to communicate with horses. Yeah, she's a horse whisperer. And she loves her horse, Alexander the Great. Um, who was a little horse. But oh. like a, it's like a little mean horse that would bite people. A little pony. And her parents get sick of him biting everybody and have him put down. Mm-hmm. And Deirdre is so mad. She wishes both of her parents were dead. And they do die from a plague. And she takes off riding on the new horse that her dad got her. But... She didn't take the time to get to know him, so she gets thrown off, and her legs get crushed. And then because she can't really move, she spends her time riding and eventually gets popular. I think I like Deirdre a lot. Yeah, she was a pretty good character. Um, Especially since I think she was like, what, 13 when this accident happened? Mm-hmm. And she just decided, well, I'm going to be an old lady now. (laughs) Yeah, it describes as an old lady, but she's like 30 or something. Yeah, she's a 30-year-old virgin. Well, she's also cool, too, because she's she's like a fancy lady. She's a she's a wealthy London fancy lady, but she she wishes to be a mall (laughs) or or a wench. Yeah. Or just like a. A sort of scandalous, adventurous woman of the night or something. Yeah. Um. And in the beginning, Dylan, who's her carriage driver, calls her a mall or a wench or something. And she gets, like, super excited. Oh, you think so? (sighs) Um. And Dylan is basically just a sexy hunk she hired to drive because she wanted to (laughs) hang out with a sexy dude. She just picked, like, the hottest guy in Bath, or I don't know if it was Bristol to Bath or Bath to Bristol, just the hottest guy to be her cab driver so she could spend time with this hunk. Um, So everyone in the book finds Dylan to be the sexiest man. Well, they describe him as... Uh, you know, an impossibility. He's like 6'3", but 140 pounds, but rippling with muscles. He, he's also described as super hairy, and he yeah. looks like a rumpled bear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, they describe... He has, like, crazy wild black hair. And he's got a furry chest, and he's got yeah. huge muscles, but also he's incredibly skinny. Um, I don't think Thomas Burnett Swan fully understands weight or age. 
Um, yeah. Because Deirdre talks about herself like she's an ancient old woman, but she's only 30. And Dylan's, what, like 25? Mm-hmm. And... We'll, we'll get to Adeline. Okay, all right. Um, okay. <laughs> but, so Dylan's story is he was a sailor and he came down with, what did he come down with? I don't remember. Some, some sickness where they didn't want him on the boat anymore and they left him. But after they left, he, he got better and he's sort of doing odd jobs while he waits for his ship to come back or he can get on another ship. Uh, he's also a descendant of Robert Herrick, who's an author or not, who's a poet I've never heard of from English antiquity. He wrote, gather ye rosebuds while ye may. <laughs> That's his thing. Um, but because of this, he's more educated than your average sailor because his family had this poet in his ancestry so they always were more well read. Thomas Burnett Swan just wanted to write about more poets. Yeah, he's obviously super into poets and poetry. We also get Dylan's backstory. And you know I love this part. <laughs> um he was like 15 and there's like an old widow in his village. That he delivers milk to. Yeah, he delivers milk to this old widow. And she keeps, like, answering the door. And she's, like, dressed super scantily. Showing off. Not that scantily. They're just Puritans. Yeah. He's a Puritan. <laughs> um, and she seduces him over time. I don't know. She- she shows him the secrets of it's, love. Yeah, it's like the whole new world part of Aladdin, but it's an <laughs> like a mature woman and a very young boy. Uh, but it doesn't focus, I guess, it, it doesn't really focus on the sex, though obviously that's happening. What she's really showing him is a world outside of, um, a world outside of Puritanism. Uh, she's a pagan. And she has all these idols and witchcraft type things. It's like herbs and poultices for different problems. And she's a widow. She, they suspect she's a widow that she poisoned her husband. Yes. Um, and she's accused of murdering her husband and of being a witch. They burn her at the stake. And Dylan runs and tells her to tell them it's not true. And she's like, oh, no, it's true. I did kill him. (laughs) And not only did she kill him, she is a witch. She has a foxtail. So this this was one of the times where the reader, the reader's voice for this character influenced my picture of her because... Her her name is Arachne, by the way. Oh. Or Arachna. Arachne, yeah. Yeah, we didn't injure... Arachna <laughs> is the older lady who's a witch. The way that she sounds, I imagined her coming to the door in, like, a robe and slippers, curlers in her hair, cigarette <laughs> hanging out of her mouth. <laughs> you got the milk today, boy? <laughs> <laughs> um, but... And she's described as being like such an old woman, but this still old super widow. Sexy. Well, she's only twenty five. <laughs> well, maybe for Puritans, that's kind of old. <laughs> I mean, it's old considering he was fifteen. But yeah, I should say that the reason I was really into this part is not because of an older woman having sex with an underage boy. It's because I'm super into witches. Yeah. Um. So, as she's dying, she places a curse onto Dylan because it was his father that accuses her. The curse. Do you want to explain the curse? Um, I I didn't really see it as an actual curse. Just kind of because 
she was the first woman he loved, and it's so tainted with witchcraft and religious uh, problems. <laughs> yeah. um, and his father was the one who accused her that forever he would have problems loving people. And, like, no other woman would be able to live up to Arachne, and he'd never be able to forget about her. Yeah, which I probably wouldn't be able to forget about watching someone burn to death either. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it was an actual witch curse, which it could have been because she's an actual because she's an actual witch, or if it was just she's like this obvious situation has fucked you up, and I'm <laughs> totally cool with it. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Dylan and Deirdre, they're on their carriage ride. Their horses go wild and leave them stranded in the middle of this spooky forest. Which is called the Knot World by the local people of Bristol. Then what? They share an intimate moment in the forest. Yeah, they they find a, an old abandoned church that's a little not right. It's kind of... Spends time describing how it's kind of off from a regular church, but it doesn't matter yet. And uh, they share some Spanish wine. Yeah, and this is where Dylan calls her a mall or a wench <laughs> or something. Um, and they cuddle, which is oh, like a like a lady cuddling with a sailor. Uh, um, and before they fall asleep. A young boy named Tommy. Thomas Chatterton. Meets up with them and does some, some, basically a ranger, <laughs> does some ranger stuff so that the Drusii don't get them. Um, because the Drusii are real also. Yeah, they're all fluttering around waiting to suck their blood. Um... But Thomas leads them out of the forest and then heads back to the city on foot to bring a new carriage to pick them mm -hmm. up. Um, and Thomas describes himself as a boy poet. And he's based on an actual boy poet. Yeah. So he's based on a, a real character who, who commits suicide. Yeah. And then is buried in like a mysterious way or something in London. And then also, wasn't Deirdre based on a real person? Uh, yeah, but I forget. Um, I don't, I don't, it she's like says. A, she's like a combination of people. Uh, yeah, she's uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Mm. I, I don't know either, but apparently there was a, a lady in English history who uh, had some sort of crippling illness or injury that was a little bit in her mind and had to overcome it with courage or something. They get out. Deirdre gets back home, sits around inside thinking about Dylan while Dylan is outside the house lurking around, <laughs> just waiting to see if she did, needs another carriage ride. Uh, did you, yeah. Did you say time passes? Sometime. I don't know how much time. I thought it was a couple weeks past. Yeah. And he's just out there, like, creeping around the yard. Well, so, so Deirdre's pining for Dylan and the adventure. She wants to go back on an adventure. And and Dylan uh, has not gotten a boat because he's super into Deirdre. And he just is drinking and hanging out outside her house. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... And here we meet uh, Adeline. Aunt Adeline. Who's a fat. <laughs> <laughs> um. So is it Deirdre's aunt or just Deirdre's friend who wants to be called aunt? I think it's her aunt. Okay. Actual aunt that she thinks of as a friend. Um, so she's fat and we hear about it nonstop. <laughs> You know, at first I was okay with it because in a lot of those super classic, in a lot of classic literature, they kind of poke fun at overweight people a little bit. Uh huh. But man, it just from here to the end of the book, 
We just do not hear the end of how fat Adeline is. <laughs> she's plump. She's rotund. She looks like... She's not, amplitudinous. Uh, yeah. She looks like not just a pig, but a whole piggery. <laughs> Um, and she's always, you know, sneaking food or they're always oh running out of food God. because she's got it in her mouth. Um, but they estimate her weight at not that much. I mean, she's probably overweight. We don't know how tall she is, but she's like 180, 185. I think maybe a little bit more than that. So you're going off of the balloon Right, yeah. Where she says 130. Yeah. And then Dylan says, all right, add 50 to that. <laughs> <laughs> but then the they still didn't estimate enough uh, because the balloon still doesn't make oh, it. Okay. So I think she's more than 180. Okay. All right. Which is, I mean, there's nothing wrong with being more than 180. It's still not <laughs> massive or something that needs to be reminded of all the time. Yeah. Um. Well, but other than being a fat, Adeline <laughs> is a very successful poet in London, but only successful because she knows how to write to the people. There's there's a couple parts where she's sort of showing or talking about where she's talking to Deirdre about writing and saying, oh, if you put a sex scene, you'll get way more writers. <laughs> and if you put like a sex scene between a fancy lady and a not fancy man, you get even more readers. So... <laughs> I think she's like a dirty poet that doesn't write anything particularly literary, but is really popular at the time. Every time the characters are talking about a, a po an actual poet or they're talking about how to write, it's like Thomas Burnett Swan is just telling you what he thinks about something. Uh -huh. There's a part where they're like, oh, here's a an appropriate quote from Milton. Also, Milton sucks and I don't like yeah, him. Yeah, bold statement <laughs> to talk down to Milton. Um, but we've talked about this with other books where, you know, if you want someone, it's really hard to have a character that's a great writer or a great artist because then you have to show it. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, Swan knows he's not a great writer. So... What in Hyperion and Fall of Hyperion, there's that one character that's a, an amazing poet, and you never yeah. really get to read any of his poetry because Dan Simmons isn't a great poet. <laughs> and so he smartly stays away from trying to present great poetry. Uh, in this, Swan does the other route where he does try to present poems by these characters, and I didn't think, like, the poetry's not that bad, but it's not better than Milton. <laughs> Well, <laughs> what? I don't know. Well, maybe it's just Deirdre that hates Milton. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not really his opinion, but it seemed so out of character to just drop that in there. Oh, by the way, Milton sucks. Um, I didn't really get to analyze any of these poems because... For one, most of them were sung. And if multiple characters were talking at the same time, the reader had recorded each Ooh, character's that's a voice weird choice. saying the same line. So you hear all of them talk at once. And when we get to the horrible goblins, their voices are so weird. Oh, that's that's a weird choice. I don't think I would like that. Grape and vine. Grape and vine. Earth's Adeline. Adeline. For the hillock, Columbine. For the forest, Galentine. Earth's Adeline. Adeline. Adeline, whose amplitude enacts on Mother Earth. Rich of harvest, ripe of food, in undulating earth. Flower and vine, flower and vine. Adeline, Adeline, Adeline. A lot of, there are songs, but there's definitely poems that should be read as poems. And I did, I did spend some time with the poems. 
Oh. Because I had had just read that poetry textbook right before uh, reading this, which was uh, pretty surprising that that happened. Which was a funny... Surprising that you read the this poetry textbook? Or? Just a funny coincidence, I guess, <laughs> that I read this textbook right before reading this. Mm-hmm. So I I tried to you know analyze them and I don't I don't have anything interesting to say about the poems other than that they're n- they're not great and he made some he tried to do some weird poetry forms when he was not a great poet and he probably should have stuck to more classic forms. Well, it seemed like it seemed like it was fine for the sailor songs and all yeah. that, but anyway, was, I just I just read that textbook some <laughs> being a. Using some new poetry terms. Yeah, I'm, I'm flexing my <laughs> poetry ding dong. <laughs> okay. Um, so they're laying around, pining for each other, and Deirdre gets a letter from Tommy. So the letter says that you know, don't believe the reports of my death. Just go meet me in the not world. Good thing Deirdre's just been sit- sitting around looking for an excuse to get Dylan to drive her around again. Yeah, and again. Dylan's right outside. He's ready to go. <laughs> um, so there, there's reports that Tommy died by killing himself because he couldn't make any money as a poet, which is what happened to the actual, the actual person. Yeah. Because he was a suicide, they buried him in this common grave area that they have in London where it's unmarked. So I guess there's some mystery as to whether or not this boy poet actually killed himself in history or if he he was trying to do something to get out of debts, which they play off of in this book because Tommy has actually escaped to the not world instead of killing himself. Based on the afterword and Thomas Burnett Swan's notes, pretty sure he wrote this entire book just because he wanted to explore that idea. Yeah, I think that's cool. Um, I don't mind that. Back to there, the... There's looser bases of book. There's looser bases <laughs> of books. Yeah. So to get back to the not world, this time they decide to take a hot air balloon. Yeah, and I think that was just because Thomas Burnett Swan's like into that kind of thing. <laughs> um. He might be a steampunk guy. <laughs> I mean, this is a Victorian kind of novel. They got a hot air balloon. I think so. Um, So Dylan's friend, Squirrel, just happens to be a a balloonist. They don't spend... I don't really remember what Squirrel is like. They don't spend too much time. I think he's like... He's only interested in facts or something. Yeah, he likes facts. He likes statistics. And he's a big nerd. And... Deirdre rents a balloon from him. There's a big scene where they have to calculate the ballast and Adeline is fat. Just being a fat. Um, what? They crash their balloon into the not world? Yeah, they they didn't calculate the weight right and they ended up having to throw out a bunch of stuff they brought with them, which includes this big wooden table that they brought <laughs> for some reason. Um... And as soon as they land, they're, like, stuck in a tree. And down below them, there's a swarm of genii, which are kind of like dwarves. Like somewhere between a dwarf and a gnome. Or more like a goblin. Because yeah. they have, like, green skin and vegetable feet. Yeah, that was kind of weird. I'm not sure what that means. Well, it didn't describe the feet in detail. But there's, like, vegetable feet. Um, well, some of them are, like, pale white, and some are green, and they're little, like, children, and they have the grossest voices. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't get any gross voices, (laughs) they just sounded like dwarves or gnomes or something in my head. Um. And they really want to do it with Adeline, because she's fat. Yeah. They got the hots. They're all a bunch of chubby chasers, and... Nothing happens. They ask them where they should go to find Tommy, and they say, you got to go to the church, and we're not going to tell you how to get there, and then they leave. Oh, they were going to try to 
uh, bribe them with some cakes, but Adeline already ate them because she's fat. Aww. She got stressed when the balloon was crashing and just ate a bunch <laughs> of cakes. That was so ridiculous. Um, okay, so they spend their first night in the woods and... Some magic happens. Yes. I think this scene would also be pretty different reading it without the voices because Deirdre is going to sleep in a hammock and Dylan shows up and starts being a horn dog. <laughs> but And he's not normally a horn dog. He's normally pretty respectful <laughs> of Deirdre and is always like, Oh, it's wrong for a sailor like me to be around a lady like you. <laughs> Um, but every time he's, he talks, his voice has an echo on it in the audiobook. For this part or always? For this part. Okay. So you know right away something's up. Uh, you, you know pretty much right away when you're reading it too. Yeah. Um, Deirdre gets fed up with his, his antics. His horn dogginess. And she gives him a slap and he just vanishes into nothing. And, uh, meanwhile... Yeah, at the same time, there's a sexy lady trying to seduce Dylan. But this one isn't Deirdre, it's Arachne? Arachna? Arachne. Arachne. But it turns out Arachne is actually Arachne. It's not a phantom or anything. And she's still alive after being burned and is in the not world. And he refuses her. She's mad about it. But she leaves Mm -hmm. for now. I think this is also about the time when it tells Adeline's sad backstory. Oh, yeah. So the reason she's a fat, because uh, in this book, she doesn't deny being a fat, even though it's, I don't know, whatever. Um, The reason she eats so much and she's a fat is because her husband died and she was super depressed about it. (laughs) Yeah. And she... Uh, deals with the sadness by eating, but also never wants to remarry, so tries to make herself unattractive to possible suitors by being a fat, because in this book, being a fat is the worst thing you could possibly be. At least according to Dylan. Yeah. Yeah, she was, like, so depressed. She, like, stops going to parties. She just stays at home eating and being sad. And it's, like, she's the fat comic relief. (laughs) But then there's this sad backstory about it. But then right after, it just goes back to her fat. Like, right right after that, to give her such a hard time about this is ridiculous. Um, Then there's the orgy. Orgy number one. Orgy number one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> While they're walking to the church. Dylan and Deirdre lose track of Adeline, but they go back to find her. <laughs> and she's completely nude, hanging out next to a maypole, which just is a statue of a giant wiener. And the little Jenny eye are all crowding around, singing some songs, and, um... Flower and vine, flower and vine. Adeline and Dylan have different ideas about how this orgy is going to turn out. Because <laughs> Dylan believes they're, they're going to do the sex part and then they're going to eat her. And oh, Adeline really? doesn't even believe that they're going to do the sex part. She just thinks they're kind of worshipping her. Yeah, he mentions cannibals in the indies and uh, other stuff. But this is one of the scenes that has a picture. <gasps> oh my god. Now that is a woman of way more than 180. Yeah. The picture shows a very rotund woman, but um, there are flowers covering anything that would be too lewd, and the maypole is a penis, and there's some little naked Jenny eye dancing around her. Uh, So I liked that Adeline 
kept her like proper lady attitude throughout this whole scene and the whole book really she's like she's just mad at Deirdre and Dylan for like breaking up this orgy because it's so rude (laughs) and um yeah well it's interrupted though and they they save her though she doesn't want to be saved uh they meet up with Hadrius, 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 who's the good Jenny I, one of the good ones, uh, because rescuing Adeline uh, hurt Deirdre, and it takes her weeks to recover from a leg injury. Really? Yeah, they spend weeks at Hadrius's house. What? Yeah. I thought it was like one night. No, no, it's weeks. Okay. Well. So, they what? They make some beer together? Yeah, Hadrius' house is kind of like a little hobbit hole. He's got all sorts of different food things, got some books on poetry. He's also a miller, so he grinds his own grains and Uh makes flour. Yeah, and and one of the activities is uh, Dylan and he make beer together. And they sing the beer song, which I'm sure was a much bigger event for you (laughs) than it was for me. (laughs) Um. Malt, sugar, water, deal a yeast, up to yeah. Oh, look, Ash brought us a toy. Thanks, Ash. <laughs> so while they're hanging out, someone knocks at the door. Turns out it's a horse with flippers. <laughs> <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> And the horse grabs Dylan and runs away with him. Deirdre goes after him to save him. But then she gets got by one of these horse things Mm -hmm. and gets carried away by it. Yeah, and it turns out that that horse is a reincarnation or a ghost of Alexander the Great, her horse her mean little pony that died (laughs) are you sure i thought she just told this horse the story about her horse um well it's it's not totally clear but when she's being dragged she like climbs on its back and realizes even though it's a nightmare it's a male so it can't be a nightmare it has to be something else and um yeah it's unclear if it's actually alexander the great I thought it, I interpreted it as Alexander the Great's spirit in this water horse. At this time, because Arachne had been introduced here and because of this Alexander the Great, I was thinking, oh, the not world is kind of like a purgatory or a sort of in between worlds kind of thing where ghosts could end up or like the dead could end up there if they got lost or something. Um, Which. It still could, based on the way it ends. It could be that. Mm-hmm. She uses her horse whispering skills to tame the water horse. Yeah, even if it wasn't Alexander the Great, she probably could have horse whispered. Um, but the horse that got Dylan was a nightmare because it takes him back to its gross nest full of gross baby water horses <laughs> and dangles him above the nest. Well, all the baby water horses rip off his clothes and buttons. Mm -hmm. And Arachne saves him. Well, she didn't really save him because she sent the horse to go get him. Right? I I guess. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, she still saves him from death. I guess. She she saves him from being nibbled to death. Yeah. But the way she she trades a large human-sized doll, because it turns out nightmares don't kill people to eat them. Or anything, they kill humans to play with them. Oh, like God. they're a toy. So this human sized doll worked just as fine. Oh my God. Um, and Arachne has her slave Drusii, and she brings Dylan back to this mansion she's been building, and she wants to do Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deirdre. Rides her water horse to the rescue. She uses her cane 
to sword fight Arachne mm-hmm. and beats her. But Arachne's also a witch, so then she just uses her witch powers. Yeah. They they have some regular old uh, fist fighting, which Deirdre wins because she has now overcome her injury. She's realized that a good portion of it was inside her head. And the power of love also. Yes. Uh, she says her man a lot of times. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... You know, classic way to beat a wizard, just walk up to him and punch him in the face. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But uh, unfortunately, Arachne gets to use some of her magic and captures them both. So she tries to hang Deirdre. Mm -hmm. But good thing at the last minute, Dylan is so sexy, he seduces the tree. (laughs) That she's being hung from. (laughs) And the tree gently puts Deirdre down so that she doesn't die. And, okay, so then Arachne's just like, okay, well, let's just try this again at a different tree. Yeah. <laughs> but we all know Dylan's too sexy for any tree. Um, uh, but then Adeline shows up with all the... Ge- the Jenny I The Jenny A little army of horrible goblins. And... Everyone's so confused. How'd you convince all these unhelpful dwarves to actually help us? It's all thanks to orgy number two. Yeah. Adeline just sleeps with all the dwarves. <laughs> and then they're going to help. Um, so. Which is a lot of things. You yeah. can have a lot of feelings about that, but <laughs> Adeline's cool with it. So I'm cool with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like she had a great time. Yeah. You know, as long as everyone's cool, I'm cool. It's like, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then the, Arachne just is like, okay, well, I'm going to sail off into the world to do evil somewhere else. Yeah. At first I felt weird that they didn't decide to kill her, but then I realized she could probably come back to life or something. But... Arachne also gives up on uh, Dylan, which is whole thing. Her whole reason for being in the not world is she just wants to be with Dylan, which is like, I mean, I guess he's the sexiest guy in the world, so it makes yeah, sense. sexy rumpled bear. She's like a witch, like a super old witch. At this point, she tells her background and... Uh, what which, part, which part of her background? Well, Arachne just tells her whole life story where she was a witch a long time ago. And then she was, um, like, in, like, a castle with kings or something. I don't know. And then she was killed for being a witch. And she went to hell and she made a deal with Satan to come back to Earth and spread evil. Which she does, but also she's going to have sex with some underage boys also. And she moves to the not world and takes it over. And forces out all the ancient gods and spirits in there. And they list a bunch of D&D gods that used to live in <laughs> the not world. And I think the G- the Jedi uh, revolt or something. And she decides to leave and goes to the Puritan town where Dylan is. Where she then has sex with Dylan and is killed again. Mm-hmm. And... <laughs> Then she comes to the not world again to her old house. So it's it's weird. Like the not world is a, a magical place, but also a place where Arachne had set up an empire that had fallen. And then she comes back so she can have sex with Dylan again. <laughs> I think I zoned out for this part both times I listened to it. <laughs> it was too complicated. Yeah, she she lived... Arachne lived a long, long life as a witch and did a lot more interesting things than have sex with, like, one 15-year-old boy. (laughs) So she's somehow able to move on, move past it. Yep, and she's going to go continue to spread evil somewhere else. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) The notes just say the tree is Hadrius's wife. Yes, it also turns out that that tree that was super into Dylan was Hadrius's wife. Because all the genii are male and they marry trees, but they don't have sex with trees. That would be weird. 
Why was this part in the book? <laughs> uh, well, they were just sort of... At the, at the end of the book, he realized he hadn't explained what the not world was or the ecosystem or any of it. So he just like shoved in as much world building as possible <laughs> right at the end. And it came off real weird. Uh, yeah, so the genii coax uh, fruit out of the trees. And this is the way those the trees <laughs> propagate. Sorry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but Hadrius... And this specific tree had been having a couple's quarrel. <laughs> a little marital dispute. Yeah. So this tree was pretty down for Dylan at the time. <laughs> um, but then they make up. But then the tree is like, Hadris, if you ever mess up again, I'm going straight to Dylan. <laughs> uh, so then Deirdre and Dylan... Live happily ever after? Yep, they live in the not world. Do they really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, they, and they have a, a baby. And they live happily ever after in the not world. Oh, and then sort of as an afterthought, they also found Tommy. Oh, yeah. Who's who's there. The whole reason they showed up in the not world, Tommy. And he wasn't, he had nothing to do with Arachne. He was just there. They didn't get to him yet. <laughs> oh, I thought Arachne, like, used Tommy to lure them there somehow. Yeah, you but would it, think that. It wasn't super clear. Um, and it turns out uh, Tommy is one of those D&D gods, but he's he's like the, the patron spirit of the not world. So it turns out Tommy is the not world, <sighs> like he's a part of it. Right. Uh, you know, that boy poet that killed himself was too great for this world. The end. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have any other thoughts about the book? Not really. I think this is my favorite of the books we've done for this podcast so far. It has a lot of problems that I, you know, <laughs> looked over. <laughs> I think there was a lot that I kind of like... That was kind of weird. I'm just going to disregard that <laughs> yeah, and pretend just, this person just didn't just say through. that. Like, all of Dylan's, like, internal monologue was pretty negative. <laughs> like, Yeah, basically the more time you spend with Dylan, uh, which is progressively throughout, it starts out you're mostly in Deirdre's head, and then it, by the end of the book you're mostly in Dylan's head, and there's sort of like a, a transition throughout the book. And the the more time you spend with Dylan, the worse it gets. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know. It just had a lot of... I really liked the style. And even though the writing could be a little stilted sometimes, it did a really good job of giving you that... Giving you the feel that he was going for. And Yeah. It was a fun <coughs> adventure. But definitely the first half of the book was much better than the second half. I did think it was interesting that we read this right after the other horse book. Because <laughs> there were some similarities. Between this and a Texas Christmas <laughs> yeah. Wish? Yeah. Well, I was thinking, like, in A Texas Christmas Wish, we hear so much about how good that guy smells. <laughs> but they didn't really say, like, what he smells like, other than he smells like a sexy man should smell. In this, like, Deirdre talks a lot about how good Dylan smells. Mm -hmm. But, like, at first he smells like the sea. But then the second adventure, he smells like ferns and berries. <laughs> and it actually matters because at the point when the Drusii takes the form of Dylan, mm -hmm. she also describes his smell as being, like, musky and weird. So... She's like, something's wrong because yeah. he doesn't smell as good as he normally smells. <laughs> um, this is obviously a much better romance than yeah, Texas Christmas Wish. So much better. Because uh, that's that's kind of what this book really is, is it's the, the building romance between Dylan and um, uh, Deirdre, which does a little bit start with that thing I was talking about where they're both uh -huh. instantly in love with each other. But at least... In this one, um, they sort of change from um, 
sort of familial love. They like they consider each other brother and sister. There's like a weird like friend zoned thing going yeah. on. Um but then they both realize that no, they don't love each other like a brother or sister. They love each other like they want to put their penises in their vajus. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, there's like two kinds of love. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yep. <laughs> Were there other ways there's someone in the other horse book? <laughs> uh, there's both. Both have horses on the cover. <laughs> no, uh, just a similar romance story, but that's it. <laughs> so, who do you think this book is for? Well, it's a little bit for me because it, it hits those two like pleasure points of very classic fantasy and witches. Oh, yeah. So, uh, no matter how bad this book was, I was probably going to enjoy it a little bit. But I would say it's also, I think the people who would enjoy this most are D and D nerds, Ooh. people who are really into Dungeons and Dragons, both specifically and other role playing games. There's a lot of gods and creatures in here that are in the D and D handbook and monster manual that I don't think your average reader would know. But that I think we were able to pick out pretty easily. Yeah, you could probably use that as a setting or a little <laughs> adventure seed for your next campaign. I wasn't thinking that. I was just thinking that um, uh, people who had read through those would be much quicker to pick up all the different creatures and like, uh, um, like the gods and spirits and stuff would come much more naturally. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess like, a silly adventure in a forest. It's kind of like a role-playing game, uh, though a bit more romantic than any I've played. Um, what about you? Who do you think this book is for? So, I thought this book was probably for lovers of English literature, people really into mythology, because that's obviously Thomas Burnett Swan's his jam. And from his afterward... He's just a big nerd for English literature. It's full of references that I would not have picked up on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say if you're into like Dunsany and stuff, this would be a fun pastiche of it. But you know who this book is not for is historians. Because I did scroll through a couple of reviews. <laughs> and there were some people who were very upset about the anachronisms he even says in the back, like, okay, I know they didn't have hot air balloons at this time. I was just, I'm just really into hot air balloons. Deirdre's fashion is all wrong for the time. She's wearing dresses that went out of style. Oh, you know who, you know who cares a lot about that is steampunk people. Oh. Steampunk people care a lot about having the correct outfit for like the correct time period. Well, it's not, it's not for historians. Yeah. It's not historically accurate. <laughs> uh, is that it? Yeah. I think that's it for The Knot World by Thomas Burnett Swan. If you'd like to join us next month, we're doing a Valentine special. We are reading The Silver Metal Lover by Tanith Lee. Everybody know. Crack a crock and muddle malt, sugar water, deal a yeast, up to elbow, stir and salt, set seven days to brew at least, tip the jug. In the mug, yo, yo -ho -ho, and a swig of beer. Tip the jug against the mug, yo, -ho -ho, and a swig of beer. When she's down the ladder, go, jacket blue and curl. Chief Red, beer and wenches, yo ho ho, get 
toss them in a tavern bed. One will do, better to yo ho, ho and the sailors dear. One will do, better to yo ho, ho and the sailors dear.